Good evening and welcome to this joint work session of the Eugene City Council and the Eugene Planning Commission. I now call the October 18th, 2021 City Council work session to order. Uh, good evening, my name is Ken Beeson. I'm the chair of the Eugene Planning Commission and I now call the October 18th, 2021 Eugene Planning Commission work session to order. Thank you all for joining us in this remote meeting format, and especially thank you to the Planning Commission members for joining us tonight. Uh, using this format as our state and community recover from the COVID-19 pandemic. This format enables us to meet and take care of business while keeping everyone safe. For work sessions like this one, where there is no opportunity for public comment, those wishing to access the meeting can do so by watching the live stream available on our website, the broadcast on Comcast Channel 21, or by calling in to one of the phone numbers listed for this meeting on the public webcast and meeting materials web page. And as always, other avenues of communication with me, the city councilors and the commissioners are available, including email. And thank you again for joining us and for tuning into this meeting. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to the city manager. Thank you, Mayor and Council Chair Beeson and Planning Commissioners. I'm gonna to add to the thank you parade because I know that we, I plugged this meeting in with not a lot of notice, and I appreciate that everybody was able to make the time to attend tonight and that staff were able to put together a presentation. We ask a lot of our planning staff, so thank you for that. And I will just say, in all of my years of working for the city, I spent a number of those in PDD. Uh, there's never been a time where I didn't hear the pl planning commission want to spend a little bit more time with the council, and I know when we did the council, goals and operating procedures last year, there was also a desire to share more time with boards and commissions. So the things that are ahead of you uh, this winter and next year are, are big, they're always big. And so I think this is a really great way to, to set the context for that. So I'm just very grateful for you, for all of you for stepping up to do this really hard work that takes a lot of time. And I'll um, ask Alyssa Hansen to kick off the presentation. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor and Council and Planning Commissioners. Um, I think you all know me, but Alyssa Hansen, I'm the Planning Director. And tonight I have with me uh, Terry Harding, who manages planning's community planning and design team, and Gabe Flock, who manages our land use team. Um, and let's say your last joint meeting was in October of 2018. So it's been a little while since you've, well, whoever was on those boards and commissions have all been in the same room. And um, it sounds like similar to what the council asked for in their goal setting, uh, the planning commission earlier this year in their retreat said, hey, we'd really like to have more regular meetings with the council as well. So this meeting is, is really timely. Terry, are you ready to start? Oh, there we go. Awesome, you can go next. All right, so this is what Terry and I are gonna to cover today in uh, the presentation. I'm just gonna give you a quick refresher of the purpose and role of the planning commission, give you some highlights of planning division's work plan, and then Terry's gonna do a little bit deeper dive into the middle housing product, project. As you know, we are entering the public hearing uh, phase here. And so this is really an opportunity for to everyone get the same level of understanding uh, for both bodies um, as it relates to the process and public engagement and next steps. Next. All right, just real quick, as a reminder, the Planning Commission is seven volunteers that are appointed by council, six of whom are with you tonight. Um, they do serve at large for four year terms. And their main purpose is to engage our community and support the council in making important land use decisions. And they do this um, in three main ways. Uh, first is by making official recommendations on legislative action. So these are typically land use code amendments or changes to policies and comprehensive plans. The middle housing project is squarely a legislative action and um, they will be providing a recommendation to you after their public hearings process. Their second role is to make quasi judicial land use decisions. I always have a problem with that word, but it's, it is really, uh, they serve a judge like role and that is typically on land use appeals. And these are things that tend to not reach up to the council level, but uh, planning commission does serve as a local decision maker um, 
on several types of land use appeals. And their third role is by serving as the city's um, designated citizen involvement committee. And in this role, they provide guidance and input on public involvement in land use processes. All right, next. All right, thanks, Terry. All right, so I just wanna take a little bit more time on this third role. Although the Planning Commission and particularly this commission takes all three of their roles very seriously. Um, this one uh, gets a lot of, a lot of talk. Um, oops, wrong slide, but there we go. Um, let's see, so they serve as our Citizen Involvement Committee and this is a required function under statewide planning goal one. Every city needs to have a Citizen Involvement Committee and the Planning Commission has served as ours since 2004. In this role, they regularly advise staff on public outreach and engagement on our planning projects, and they help promote those as well. They also uh, review um, public involvement plans for our major projects. So any of the, the major planning projects underway, the Planning Commission reviewed the public involvement plan for each of those. They also provide comments uh, on public involvement during the course of projects and advise on potential changes and additions as needed. Um, they also participate, um, they assist with implementation and they participate in direct engagement quite often, especially for larger product projects. They hear from folks at their regular meetings during public, their own public forum. They often attend uh, open houses and other uh, opportunities to listen and observe. And they also serve on project, as project resources for our main project, project. So about two to three of them will um, provide advice to staff and others um, as we move forward with implementing project uh, public involvement plans specifically. Um, and this year, well, actually the last couple of years, we've really seen an increased focus on equity inclusion from the Planning Commission um, in the public involvement plans, but also just in they moved their meetings to the evenings so that more people can participate and it will hopefully be easier to recruit more for the Planning Commission. All right, next. All right, so as I mentioned, uh, this is a highly engaged group. They had, I think this is a record of 41 planning commission meetings last year. Um, and this was in a pandemic, so they were all on Zoom, minimum of two hours. 12 of these meetings were on middle housing. 10 of them were public hearings, and that includes three appeals and four code amendments. Um, they also had a retreat, they had a fair housing training. Um, and then they have volunteered well over a thousand hours during this the past fiscal year. And that's really an undercount um, because it only accounts for their meetings and, and some uh, prepping for those. As I mentioned, they also serve on subcommittees and resource groups. We have um, folks that are on the Envision Eugene Technical Advisory Committee, folks that are on the Historic Review Board, um, project resource groups as well. I will just say about this planning commission that they are highly engaged, they are dedicated to the community and they really take their role to heart and we are really appreciative of how thoughtful and thorough they are in their review and that they listen and consider and that they really take their service to heart. Go ahead, Terry. And then I'm gonna go ahead and shift to the work plan. So we'll go to the next slide. So this is the planning division's work plan. It's very small. I don't expect you to be able to, to read this on the screen. Um, it is provided as attachment A to tonight's agenda item summary. Um, I guess the highlights to know is that there are three main categories. The first is our ongoing programs and projects such as board and commission support and uh, coordination and support with some of our other, our other main partners. Um, the second category is land use code and plan implementation. This is uh, kind of mandated work of reviewing land use applications and um, ma managing the historic preservation program, helping folks who want to do projects in the city, and then trying to keep our, our code maintained. And then the final set are, are Envision Eugene implementation projects. We often call these our long range projects. 
And these are divided into active, what we're working on now, or in this case, also recently finished, and then our on deck projects, which um, are a mix of uh, city council directives and known state mandates. Um, as you can tell, we have a full slate of ongoing and active work that ranges from, you know, kind of more administrative to council directed and state mandated. Um, and I think that's all I have for that slide. So go ahead, Terry. This is our uh, current planning team. And I really wanted to give a shout out to them because these are the 17 people who manage and do all of the work on the work plan um, on the previous slide. So everything from sending out mailings to creating maps to reviewing land use applications, writing code, uh, being responsible for public engagement and everything in between is done by, well, I'll say these 16 people because I'm in there too. Um, I will just, they are awesome. They're, if you've worked with them at all, they are resilient, resourceful, creative. They are committed to their work and they're committed to the community. Um, and so let's go ahead. I'm gonna cover next, Terry, um, a little bit about the land use code and plan implementation. So about seven of our staff are actively involved in this work. Um, and just for, as an example, in fiscal year 21, we had almost 300 land use applications submitted. And this is everything from a property line adjustment an annexation, subdivision, zone changes, planned unit developments. Um, those, that's a lot of applications. Um, and then I just listed the only types that come to council, just um, most of them are either planning director level or hearings official level with an occasional appeal to the, the planning commission, but uh, there are a handful of that where council actually is the decision maker. Uh, go ahead, Terry. I'm going to skip over to the long range project. So I think you're all familiar with Envision Eugene, and it was our largest community engagement effort undertaken um, by the city. It's, it's about making sure that we can manage our growth in a way that protects and enhances our quality of life and reflects our shared boundaries. The state mandate was to create a Eugene specific urban growth boundary that accommodates our 20 year population growth. But we also used it as a local opportunity to create an actual vision for the city of Eugene because we had long shared a comprehensive plan and policies with Springfield and this was really a chance to have our own identity separate from Springfield. Go ahead, Terry. Um, so on the left are the seven pillars of Envision Eugene. And um, these were, uh, these really reflect our community values that came up through the public engagement of Envision Eugene. And they are the foundation for the planning projects on our work plan. And they're just as relevant today as they were um, when they were created back in 2012. Um, I mean, when you look at these, um, you can, you know, really see that we're still, I mean, those are still all very relevant and, uh, you know, what we're working towards today. On the right side is, a, is the community vision, and it emb embodies the seven pillars, and it also shows how we grow responsibly. It includes the land for jobs, land for homes, parks and schools, um, with a highlight for downtown and our core commercial areas along the corridors as well. All right, go ahead, Terry. So just real quick, um, there we have four main active projects underway right now. Uh, we're only going to talk about one of these tonight. I know many of you might be really interested in the first, second, or potentially the third item on this list, but I'm hopeful that we can um, keep our discussion about middle housing um, when we get there. So the first three are city-initiated projects um, that came out of the Urban Growth Boundary and Envision Eugene. And you'll be hearing from uh, these project teams in starting in early 2022, um, particularly with growth monitoring, followed by urban reserves, and then eventually River Road, Santa Clara. Um, and then the focus of today's discussion is really on middle housing, which as you know, is a state mandate through House Bill 2001. Go ahead, Terry. 
And these are upcoming projects. So we haven't started on any of these, um, but we know that they're coming. The left side um, lists the state mandates that, that we know of that we'll actually have to start working on sometime in 2022. And then on the right side are the locally initiated projects. I will say all of the state mandates do have um, state mandated deadlines for adoption, similar to HB 2001. And um, some of the rulemaking is still in place. So we're trying to refine how that plays out for timing. We do know that the projects on the right are of equal importance, if not more important to our community, but we do have to balance that with our need to meet the state mandates. Um, go ahead, Terry. And then finally, these are just, I wanted to make sure we mentioned that we do work on a number of projects with other work groups, divisions, departments, community partnerships. You know, you heard about the housing implementation pipeline. Um, also do infrastructure planning, transportation planning, and climate uh, planning as well. And these all align with, you know, other city policies. So I think we're ready to turn to middle housing. And Terry's going to give you um, a deeper dive into this active project. Thanks, Alyssa. I'll try to keep this brief because I want to have plenty of time for discussion. And there's lots of you that um, we hope will talk and ask questions tonight. So that's great. A quick reminder about the goals of the Middle Housing Code Amendments project. The first and foremost goal is to comply with the House bill and really make sure that we implement it in a way that is legally sound. After we do that, we are hoping to enable housing availability and diversity of type and further our ongoing housing work aimed at addressing equity and affordability. This is straight from the text of the law. So no later than June 30th of next year, the city of Eugene must allow a duplex on each lot or parcel in residential zones that allow detached single dwellings and the other middle housing types, triplexes, quadplexes, cottage clusters, and townhouses in residential zones that allow detached dwellings, single dwellings, but not necessarily on every lot or parcel. And those rules are mostly tied to lot size. And I'll show you a map a little bit later. This is our project timeline and the planning commission has been very involved every step of the way. Since the beginning, the planning commission gave input into and then approved our public involvement plan and our project approach. They then reviewed the outreach results and guided development of the code concepts, oversaw code writing, the code writing phase, asked questions about the state rules during rulemaking and after, um, and asked a lot of good questions about what options we had for Eugene and how to encourage affordability through the code. Now we're preparing to gather public comment through the formal public hearing process. This effort included all of the typical engagement strategies and added a few new ones. We did a community wide survey, which received 741 responses from a cross section of the city. We pulled together 79 community members for roundtable and focus group discussions, piloted a lottery selected panel with Healthy Democracy, partnered with seven equity focused organizations and posted content and interacted with interested people on three social media platforms. It's the most robust and equitable engagement effort we've ever done in planning. We framed the early outreach around three levels of implementation. So you'll hear these words a lot. The allow level is basically to do the minimum required by the state. The encourage level is to reduce more barriers to middle housing and go further than the state minimum standards. The incentivize level is to do even more and try to lower the costs of providing middle housing. All of the outreach groups tended to agree to go beyond the minimum standards, which is why the recommended code does just that. Strong themes emerged from the outreach done with the different groups and the general public. The four themes include a focus on equity and inclusion, encouraging and incentivizing middle housing across the community, 
near transit routes, encouraging compact development by reducing parking requirements, and going beyond the code to pursue incentives and programs for middle housing. We're working hard right now to publish some summary information about the code proposal. In general, the recommendations fall between the encourage and incentivize options discussed by the Planning Commission in response to what we heard from the public. Here's a list of some of the topics that we hear a lot of conversation about and that we're preparing summary information for as we speak. This is an example of the draft standard for duplexes. And I'll point out for the Planning Commission that this is revised since you saw it last week because we've been working on improving our information and making it more clear for the public. So now the table compares the minimum state standard in the left column to the model code in the middle and the proposed Eugene standards on the right. In this example, the proposed lot size for duplexes goes further than the state standard and the model code to encourage middle housing. The guide to the adoption process is being prepared right now in response to legal review, and we aim to have it ready to go for this week's information session. Sessions, plural, we have one Tuesday and Thursday. We hope it will help the Commission, Council, and the public prepare for the hearings process. A bit about housing affordability. We have heard a lot about this throughout the process, and it's definitely a goal of our community and a real need in our community and our state. So the project team has prepared a new affordability FAQ, middle housing affordability FAQ, to answer some of the most frequently asked questions. While the city cannot require that new middle housing be affordable to people earning limited incomes, there are things we can do to encourage lower cost housing. We can allow smaller lots, reduce parking requirements, offer density bonuses for owners who choose to keep some units affordable and reduce city fees and property taxes for middle housing. And those are all things that are in the draft code or under discussion through the housing implementation pipeline. This is a new map that we've prepared that is key to draft the lot size recommendations in the code. This will be published online along with the guide. There's a new column in the legend that shows which housing types are proposed to be allowed in each lot size category. Of course, subject to other standards is what the footnote says. Once this is on the web, it's a really handy tool you can zoom in on and check out the different lot sizes in your part of town. Here are our next steps in the process. There are opportunities for public involvement at the plan Planning Commission public hearing, which is scheduled for November 16th. Then the Planning Commission goes into deliberation sessions and forms their recommendation by the end of this year. The staff will bring the Planning Commission's recommendation to the City Council for a public hearing in early 2022. And then Council will have decision making opportunity and must act prior to June 30th or the model code will apply in Eugene. This is my last slide and it's a plug for our upcoming middle housing information sessions. There's two this week on Tuesday and Thursday at the times listed on this slide and on our website, you can get the Zoom links for those information sessions. There's another one next week and then the public hearing on November 16th. I'll stop sharing and look forward to your discussion. Thank you. Thank you. I um, really appreciate this, and I have notes that uh, that the manager might have comments to say at this point. Or are you holding on that, sir? No. Okay. So, um, thank you so much. I, there are so many pieces of this presentation that are absolutely stunning, and uh, the first is you had 41 meetings in a year. There are only 52 weeks in a year. I'm just pointing that out. <laughs> that's that's a lot of meetings in a year and not counting all of the additional things that planning commissioners have done and 
you know, I think of the image of the duck swimming that the duck seems to be very serenely swimming on, along the water, but in fact is paddling furiously underwater. And so I feel as if we're a little bit the duck, it's looking very serene up here and not, and you have just pointed out to us that underwater, you're just paddling as fast as you can to get through this amount of work. And so appreciation to the commissioners and also appreciation to the staff, because this is a mountain of projects that you continue to climb and all of them complicated. And many of them fraught with um, tension and controversy. And so um, just very much want to appreciate your work. So are there uh, counselors with questions or comments? Uh, the, my planned procedure here, I guess I should frame this up for you. As we have done with other joint meetings, I will keep a queue of the councillors as I always do. Chair Beeson will keep a queue of the commissioners. We will alternate back and forth. So I'll, and I'll, uh, it'll be one, one councillor and then followed by one commissioner just back and forth through the meeting. I'm giving everyone just two minutes uh, because there are a lot of people in the room. We'll go through a first round. And then when we have time for a second round, if we have to cut that to one minute, we will. So. With that, I already have two counselors in the queue, and so I will uh, turn it over to Councillor Groves to start, and um, we'll take it from there. Well, thank you, Mayor. Uh, thank you, staff, for the presentation, and thank you to the Planning Commission for um, all of your work. It's amazing. Uh, trying to, to look at where the balance is in this uh, situation as we try to develop more housing, which we desperately need, but trying to look at where that balancing point is between more housing that's affordable and livability. Um, I look at the parking um, density and, and I wonder, have there been any projections on what that will do uh, based on no requirement for off-street parking? Do we, do we have an idea of, of how that's going to impact our neighborhoods? Guess not. Well, I might. I might suggest maybe Terry. Maybe Terry could take that question. Thank. Thank you. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. The parking idea to reduce came from the project team as an idea that could help reduce the cost of providing housing. Um, one of the comments that has surfaced, and I'll I'll stop after this, is that. Removing the requirement to build parking doesn't necessarily mean that it won't get built, but it means that it doesn't have to get built. And so there has been a lot of discussion about that at the planning commission meetings. Well, that's one point of concern I have. I know there's a move to try to um, reduce the number of vehicles, especially single use vehicles, but it, it, it just seems like that's, that's one thing, one area I've heard quite a bit about that's going to create you know, problems for, for neighborhoods that are already in existence. And I, I'm just hoping we can find a way um, to navigate that. I mean, even as we switch towards electric vehicles, they require space as well. I mean, it's not like that's, uh, that's going to go away. So I hope we give some thought to that piece. Um, gosh, there's <laughs> so much to ask. Um, I, I think I'll stop for now on that, but maybe come back for a, a second round for another question I have. And I'd just like to hear what some of the other counselors have to say. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I, I, so I, I think in terms of what we're, our, our process here, kind of alternating back and forth, I guess I, I would ask at this point if there are any comments or questions, uh, anything that any of the commissioners want to say, and I'd ask that you uh, introduce yourself before speaking. Commissioner Fragola. Great, thank you. Um, my name's Lisa Fragola, and um, I live in Ward 1. I'm used to saying that from giving public comments, so um, Councillor Semple is my representative on the council. Um, I just wanted to point out that when we look at the seven pillars of our community vision, right, the economic opportunities, affordable housing, climate change and energy resiliency and compact urban development, those are all things that our community has reinforced repeatedly. 
And you will see in the public input process um, that occurred on this project, which was incredibly robust. I think it's, a, it's something to be very proud of. Um, our you know, participation actually reflected our demographics for what may have been the very first time um, approaching you know, a lot of great engagement through um, multiple levels. But when we look at those pillars and those visions for our community in addressing Councillor Grove's question, how do we find the balance between housing and livability and thinking about parking in particular? And you know, when we begin to think about livability, I think we really do need to start to think about um, our climate action plan, to think about transportation, and the, the housing, middle housing is an important part of that. And we, we're gonna have to take a look at reducing the number of vehicles that we have in the city and it's gonna take a lot of creativity. So I do think the plan does work to balance some of those ideas. Thank you, Councillor Keating. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you, Chair Beeson, Vice Chair Isaacson, and the Planning Commission members for the work and joining us today. You are underappreciated and underpaid. I will underscore underpaid, especially looking at what other municipalities across the country are, are, are paying their, their Planning Commission members. Um, Commissioner Edwards, it's good to see you, and you're not on the big screen. We're not on the big screen today. It looks like you're in your office. I have a question that, um, that regardless of where folks fall on the uh, do less, do middle, or do more to incent uh, middle housing and comply with House Bill 2001, I have found that in Ward 2, regardless of where folks fall on the spectrum, we can all agree that we need to protect and expand our tree canopy. What discussions at the Planning Commission table have uh, revolved around protecting, expanding our tree canopy coverage? What incentives can we provide uh, developers uh, to expand or protect, to expand on the, the canopy or protect the existing canopy coverage? I see Commissioner Edwards' hands up. Do you want to respond to that or? Actually, I, I think you had another comment, I, right? I, I wanted to put myself in the queue. So okay. I think possibly maybe uh, staff might be better equipped to answer that question, but. Okay. That's one for you again, Terry. Here. Yeah, I'm sorry. I am momentarily distracted because we've got an audio issue on the website, um, but it looks like Naya is on it and working with Metro to fix it. So people watching the meeting on the web right now can't hear us. So I'll just waste a couple of seconds while they try to fix it. And I would beg for you to repeat the question, please, Councillor Keating, I apologize. Well, while, while we are filling time and, 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 and waiting, I, I will filibuster appropriately and wish my colleague, Councillor Clark, a happy birthday. Happy birthday, Mike. Um, I, I believe Councillor Clark is next in the queue. And when I get a signal from the mayor that we, or Naya, that our audio is okay, I'll happily repeat the question. It is still being worked on. Um, it could take a couple minutes. I will let you know as soon as I get word from Metro. So I'll take this opportunity to say thank you, sir. It's good to see all of us together. I, I, I would long for in those 41 meetings you do out of the 52 weeks out of the year to have more of these engaging, cross-pollinating, cross-collaborating joint Commission Council meetings. Thank you. Yeah, thank you not only to the commissioners, uh, but also to the staff members. Thank you, Terry. Thank you, Alyssa, and your, and your team. And I'm, not sure, I, oh, I'm not sure how you normally handle it. If it's being recorded right now, could we go ahead and proceed? I was just going to suggest that Terry go ahead and respond to the question. Yeah. Great, happy to. Mayor, if I need to uh, uh, reiterate or, or, or repeat the question, I'm happy to. Uh, a great many folks, uh, regardless of where folks fall on the spectrum in, in regards to implementing uh, House Bill 2001 state law, uh, in, in my neck of the woods in South Eugene, long for protecting our tree canopy coverage. 
protecting and expanding our tree canopy coverage. What incentive models have been discussed at the planning commission table to incent the, the and preserve to to incent preserving and protecting the existing canopy and to expand the, the, the canopy coverage. Um, what what conversations, if any, have re revolved around uh, our, our existing tree canopy? Thank you for repeating the question. Um, I am aware of a lot of discussion around incentives or options, flexibility in the code to allow keeping an existing structure. For example, letting a duplex be two detached units would let a person who had a single uh, building add a second building detached and keep that building. That same conversation hasn't happened about trees, um, but I think it could. And I think that's an interesting idea. Um, I'm trying to think. The other item that's come up with regards to trees is that there is a provision in the law and the administrative rules that says we need to apply the same tree removal standards to middle housing as we do to single detached dwellings. And so they can't be more stringent um, than we apply to single housing. And I would submit we need to make the tree removal for a single family more stringent. Um, but I would welcome that conversation. The other question I have is in regards to displacing uh, renters or displacing low income folks. Uh, what guardrails are put in place uh, to protect folks in our community whose um, who's current residences may be um, purchased or, or, or gobbled up or, 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 or being on the, the, the slate to be uh, converted into a duplex, triplex, or quad? Yeah, thanks for that question too. Displacement is an issue we've talked a lot about and it, the answer is similar to the tree answer uh, because displacement concerns aren't unique to middle housing. They apply to all forms of housing and zoning in our community. Um, I would just also mention that the, the, the citywide interest in citywide anti-displacement and gentrification um, strategies anti-gentrification strategies are part of the housing implementation pipeline project, but they're not proposed to be any different for metal housing than they are for single housing because of that requirement of the house bill. Mayor, in the interest of time, I, I uh, that wraps my questions for now. This is the second round, I'll have to pop back up. Okay, now, now I've got uh, Commissioner Edwards. Thank you, Chair Beeson. Um, it's good to see everybody even on Zoom. I just thought I would take a moment and with my two minutes and just um, share my perspective on how I'm kind of approaching this work as we're doing, you know, as we're working through this process. I, the Planning Commission sees all of the emails that are sent to council and we receive ours as well. And, and so, you know, I, I'm, I'm reading um, thoroughly everything that we're receiving in the way of uh, public input. And the, kind of the way I've been looking at this process is that yes, we are working to implement a state law. And I think a lot of folks actually don't know that at this point, but this is also Eugene's way of customizing, you know, the, the, the way we implement this to suit our unique community and to really match the need that we have here in Eugene with action. And you know, this work obviously provides an opportunity to increase supply, diversity, smaller, more affordable units and opportunities for home ownership. Um, I think that this, the planning staff has done a tremendous job in executing on a very robust and equitable public involvement plan. And that has really brought a lot of voices to the table that we don't normally hear from. And a lot of those voices are those that are the most severely impacted in, into these conversations. Um, they're the folks who are experiencing the problem for which the legislation is aiming to provide a solution. Because I think that we've all been there, generally speaking, we hear from a lot of the same voices. We hear from those with the luxury of time and resources. And you know, yes, we've heard a lot from a lot of homeowners, 
but generally speaking, they're not living on the margins. They're not losing their homes. They're, you know, they're not experiencing the crisis that so many of those other folks have. So I'm kind of approaching this through the lens of somebody who's been there and those voices are really important to the process and kind of understanding, you know, who it is that that really is, is in such need in our community. So I'll, uh, I'll, I'll wait for another round or whatever. So thanks. Thank you, Councillor Clark. Thank you, Mayor. And thank you to all of you for the hard work. Thank you to staff for the presentation. Um, it, when we talk about housing, there's, it, from the way I see it, there are essentially three groups that, that are important to keep in mind in the planning process. There's the city and the council and the, the, the policy questions and the, and the planning commission. There's the people who actually build stuff. And then there's the market that's actually gonna buy our rent, the place that gets built. And so to Commissioner Fergala's and, and, and Councillor Grove's um, interaction there about parking at first, I would say, um, with all due respect, I, I don't know that we are going to be successful at reducing the number of vehicles so much as we in this planning may be successful at reducing the number of people who rely on vehicles. We may get a different sort of folks because if you look at what we're planning and what someone's willing to build, then the market's going to decide who wants to buy or rent that. And those people that depend on their vehicles, if we're making it harder and more expensive, won't be doing that. Um, I, I would like to ask staff, talk with me more about the presentations that have been made to commission with regard to affordability and the sorts of factors you're taking into account. Can you speak in more detail about that? You Sorry, trouble with my mute button. Sure. Um, we began talking about affordability with the Planning Commission, also had conversations with our developer focus group, which was market rate and affordable housing developers. They brought up a lot of the same issues and concerns that you're bringing up. Um, we've also talked with all of the different outreach groups. Everyone, frankly, is concerned about affordability from one side or another. Um, we have had a an economics consulting firm, Echo Northwest, on our project consultant team, and we have also used staff um, who've worked on the Clear and Objective project and other housing code projects to um, put that into the bigger context of our whole code. I'm not sure if I got it the, uh, what you're looking for. Let me try this. Aside from parking, what other um, aspects or or um, rules are are being analyzed for their effectiveness with regard to affordability. Gotcha. Okay. Well, when Echo Northwest was asked by the project team to look at how to encourage within the code or outside the code more affordability, um, they came up with a couple of different categories. And some of those were in the bullets that I showed you on the slide and are in the more complete FAQ that we just recently released. Um, parking is one of the big ones. Another big one is lot size. Just allowing more units on smaller lots allows the cost of construction to be spread across more doors. And so they brought that one up as one that's being used by other jurisdictions and is um, a common tool to be used to lower the cost of providing new housing. Then that I would say the third bucket is um, density bonuses, incentives, and other fee reduction programs. And so those we're just starting to look at, but they can happen outside of the code that we're working on right now. So more about density than about economies of scale. Is that a fair point? Within the range of middle housing and the definition of middle housing, I would say. Okay, in my opinion, a healthy community has what the West Coast average is, which is closer to 65% home ownership and 35% renters. In our community, we have much closer to 50-50 and that isn't healthy. And it's also not um, something that promotes um, a higher degree of personal income. Are we analyzing for what we're building most likely to produce ownership or most likely to produce more rentals? proportionately? Are we analyzing for that? 
We didn't ask the question that way, but we did look for ways to both lower the cost of rental housing and provide more opportunities for home ownership. Um, the lot divisions for middle housing is a way that we think more people will be able to own a home, a middle housing home is by uh, purchasing the land around the home that that is developed. I'm not sure I understood that, but I'm out of time. Mayor, can I have a second round, please? Okay, I, I put myself in the queue. I guess I'd, I want to respond to the Councillor Clark's affordability question from a, a, my perspective as we've as we've been working on this. I mean, our uh, the the statute is in place that we need to provide. Uh, allow for middle housing, and then the state has the standards that we that are that are setting the minimums for that. And we're we've had the public process, and I think what when we go and look at the amendments to the code to set those various standards, building height, and so on, um, we've taken a tack that we would, uh, to the extent we can, we would like to be more flexible. We would like to go beyond. And uh, for me, uh, one of the, the basic reasons for that is an assumption that we can, in fact, allow for more affordable housing to be constructed when there are more, more uh, units being built, when there would tend to be smaller units being built or more building types and so on. And I guess there's not a guarantee on that, but I think it's kind of an, an assumption that is in there if you can build a triplex or a quadruplex you're gonna have opportunity for some lower cost units. And when you couple it with the Senate bill 458, as Terry mentioned, and you allow for those, those kinds of units to be subdivided, you open up potential for home ownership to uh, a lot wider variety, or uh, I guess a wider range of people in the community who might right now not be able to afford a home. So that's, uh, and so when I look at all the standards, See where I am on time. I look at the standards we're looking at, whether it's lot coverage or it's building height or it's parking and so on. To the extent we can be uh, more flexible, there's an assumption it just provides more opportunity for owners and developers to build more affordable housing. So I'll stop it there. Thank you, Councillor Sarret. Thank you, Mayor. Well, it's great to see the Planning Commission, our hardworking, not paid at all Planning Commission, since Councillor Keating didn't make that clear, um, here with us tonight. Um, so I'm really excited to be at this place in our work, and I really wanted to appreciate Commissioner Fragala and Commissioner Edwards' comments about the outreach and the robust nature of that, and the fact that the Planning Commission really reach beyond um, to uh, connect with folks who typically aren't engaged in this kind of process and that that input as well as all the other input that came through is what's gone into creating the framework for this draft code. I think that's incredibly important and um, as uh, Commissioner Fragala said, very impressive. So I just want to appreciate that. Um, you know, there are details in this, in this draft that, you know, is going to cause some folks concern and we are still going to be working through that and could refine the code, um, to be responsive to some of those concerns. I wanted to comment on the concern about street, about the trees and tree canopy. Uh, one thing I would point to is that our city's street tree program could be another way for us to ensure that neighborhoods have um, good healthy tree canopy in places where we might start seeing more dense development. On this conversation that was just going on, will the code allow for duplexes, triplexes uh, to be owner occupied as individual yes. owner occupied units? Yes. That's a yes. So yes. they, they can uh, get home ownership. And could you explain, I know Councilor Clark has the same question, how the lot division would work. Sure, I'll try my best to do it succinctly um, because it is a more recent piece of legislation. So this past summer, 
Senate Bill 458 was passed, and it's the known as the Middle Housing Land Division Bill. And what that does is require cities to allow through their zoning code the division of a parent lot that has middle housing on it into child lots that each have one, one unit of middle housing on them. And that can be done in a variety of different ways, but that's the gist of it. And it's mainly to enable those middle housing units to be sold individually to owner occupants. Okay, uh, I, let's see. I've uh, I've got Commissioner Fragola in the queue. I'm not seeing other hands from other commissioners. So, Commissioner Fragola. Um, I, I wasn't sure if I was allowed to speak until all planning commissioners have been able to speak, so. Go ahead. I, yeah, go ahead. I think I'll just kind of watch, and others maybe who haven't, we'll give them a, a two-minute shot if they have something to say. Okay. Um, go ahead. I, I, I will go then. I just <laughs> wanted to address um, some of the ownership and affordability issues in terms of we have spent quite a bit of time talking about how to approach the affordability issue. Again, H HB 2001 focuses primarily on availability and diversification, um, but there were recommendations around density bonuses, um, around parking, as was mentioned, and around creating more doors that do lead us towards promoting smaller buildings, which are more affordable. There's only so much we can do in terms of getting to this, um, getting towards these goals with the code. And I think it's really important for us to keep in mind that this code project is one part of a larger toolkit that we need to be focusing on. Um, and that includes the housing implementation pipeline as well. So um, we have talked quite a bit about those topics. Thank you. Thank you. I, I just, I'm gonna make a, just a functioning uh, operational comment, which is I think we have enough time that the sec, if people come back for a second round, they can have two minutes because I think there's really just enough time to do that and I won't cut people off. And I know that um, Councilor Clark is waiting for a second round, but I just wanted to, um, you know, a couple of things. Um, I believe that the slide that we saw in advance is not exactly the same slide that we just saw tonight about the comparison between the minimum state standard and the proposed code. And I wonder if that's the issue that's sort of the crux of the issue for a lot of the community. I wonder if you could just highlight a couple of those pieces uh, for us. Um, I mean, you've addressed a little bit lot size, but maybe speak to that and um, there, you know, there's a height question, 30 to 35 feet. So I wonder if you could just uh, highlight a couple of those points. Sure, thank you. Yeah, I think I mentioned that our information is being reviewed by our legal staff. And so we're trying to make it as clear as possible. Several times, planning commission, public counselors have asked for this information that compares kind of what's required in the minimum standards what's in the model code and what are we proposing in the draft and so i only showed you duplex lot size because it's not finished and it's not ready to be published um, and the slide that was sent out earlier today was the previous version so i apologize for that but it is in progress um, and our intent is to have that complete um, by the middle of the week so that we have it ready for the information sessions and helping people get ready for the public hearing um, okay, that's excellent. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. That's what I wanted to make sure is that that was going to be out there for the public to actually see. So thank you very much for that. Uh, Councilor Clark, second round. Thank you, Mayor. As this market goes up as it did uh, year over year, 18% this last from this last month, year over year in the value of homes, people who own homes just increased how much wealth they have in their family by 18% when looking at their house. Renters had their rent go up and they don't get to keep that money. When we're, if we ask the question, how would we best increase 
um, wealth in our community or decrease wealth inequality in our community, the fastest way to do that is with more home ownership and fewer rentals, right? Um, as I mentioned real briefly, we have compared to most cities in the Western United States, a much, uh, we're disproportionately in much higher percentage rentals at 52% and 48% ownership. We are a poor community by comparison in many ways. My concern is that we're doing this work effectively and by asking people what they wanna do, we're not differentiating that point. And so what I'm concerned we not do is create a, a, a vast number of more rentals than we create the opportunity for people to own homes. And I fear that a great many of, uh, if we're not analyzing for it, that the rules we're creating may end up with that result of, you know, 80% more rentals and 20% more homes that are available to purchase. Yes, you can purchase um, duplexes and triplexes with one of those folks being an owner, but that cancels the numbers out. Um, I'd, I'd be interested to hear too from Terry what you were talking about with the parent and the ch child lot uh, information at a future point, but I will say the federal rules created by Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac are going to have more to do with what people can, um, what they're qualified to buy than will state law because they are often at odds. Can you speak to that or your knowledge of it or if we're screening for it? Um, it's a good question. I'll probably need to get back to you on part of it, but I did want to clarify that our duplexes and triplexes able to be owned under the legislation and the allowances for middle housing land division, each unit would be able to be individually owned if it were divided through our middle housing land division process. My and question is, I, can that be financed for each mm -hmm, by mm -hmm. the rules? It's a good question. Because as a, as well, a lender, I can tell you, I, I don't know that you can do that right now, even if the state changes the law, because Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac don't federally. Thank you. I'm way over time. Sorry. Um, let's see. Commissioner Isaacson. <clears throat> Well, thank you. Um, I, I wanted to uh, echo what Commissioner Frackler was just saying. I mean, this is one tool in a very large tool bag that we have to combat a, a, a multifaceted problem in our community that is going to be generational. Uh, we're only a few years into into this crisis, and it's going to be long serving um, if if we all don't uh, use as many tools as we have at our disposal. Um, I wanted to talk about some of the things that we have done, obviously passing ADUs as um, a, is a good component to it, but uh, Councillor Sarret brought out a good point, which is that you can own a portion of the property and rent out the other portion. My own story in a nutshell is um, when I lived in Chicago for 12 years, I owned a, a house that was converted into a duplex. I rented that property out, um, that other half. Um, it provided a source of equity that has launched my current standard of living um, and will have forever changed my life. Um, and you can draw a direct line between where I'm at now and where um, I will be for the rest of my life because of that. It was created by a government program, uh, the first home buyer tax credit um, that allowed me to be able to purchase the property. It had a type of mortgage, um, Councilor Clark, a 203K loan that allowed me to fold in some of the costs of the mortgage into fixing it up. Uh, there's a lot of sweat equity um, for $70,000 worth of work and $35,000 worth of financing you can get where you need to swing some hammers yourself to be able to solve that, uh, that math. But if folks want to work for it, and there are opportunities out there to provide that kind of equity, and I would tip my hat cautiously to, to, the, to the council to look at those kind of moonshot opportunities to look at re reducing the fees to uh, get some of these uh, projects greenlit. That's, that's my own personal view, but um, I think that the, the commission has done a really good job of taking our portion of the tool bag um, and crafting the code in such a way that it allows as many people the opportunity, provided that the other tools are there, to take advantage of them, to provide equity, to provide diversity, to expand upon um, our housing uh, inventory for the next generation to come.
Thank you. I don't see any other counselors uh, needing in the queue. So why don't we let Commissioner Ramey take a shot? Okay, click the wrong button there. Uh, it's great to see you all. Thanks again for all you do, commissioners, counselors, and staff together. We don't get together often enough. Um, and I think I learn something every time we do this. Uh, my own take on this process, it can't be said enough times, I'll say it again. This is a state mandated process for going through. The state is requiring us to provide, you know, units on every duplex and more units and on all our R1 properties. So what we were able to do also from the state was to fine tune that for our own needs. And in our case, we listened carefully to what people said to us in the outreach process. And what they said was, well, we want more. We want more flexibility. We want more affordability. We want more diversity in our housing. And so that's what we're trying to do. And as we look into the details, we pour into the details about how those are working. We've heard several of them come up this evening. Um, in particular, the, the parking issue uh, and the affordability issue in particular. But I would say as we look through these and me in particular through the lens of affordability, I'm trying to understand how we can create units that are in that sweet spot of 800 to maybe 1,000 square feet. Because that's really what Echo Northwest was telling us could be either purchased or afforded by those that are in that middle area of our community who can't afford housing right now. And so I'm hoping we can get there and we have some incentives in mind for building 900 square foot units, for example. I think we're still waiting through whether we can do that, uh, but certainly smaller lot sizes lowers the price, smaller lot sizes with coverage lowers the size of the unit. And so those things together create units that are smaller. And then as we've just discussed, it's four units on a lot. It could be four separate units or it could be four units as a townhome. And either way, we could sell those then as four different units by dividing up the property on the lot. So that gets us more housing that people can buy. So I look forward to working on this some more, but we got a long ways to go. I think we've made a great start. Uh, I guess a question for the mayor. Do we have time for a couple more comments? Yes, go ahead. Do we? Okay, Commissioner, uh, got Commissioner Edwards. Thanks, Chair Beeson. Um, I, I think I wanted to maybe respond a bit to Councillor Clark's comments, and I think they're they're somewhat reflective of, of some of the comments that we've received or, you know, and some criticisms of this work that, that we're not doing enough to address affordability and that the housing we're creating won't be affordable to those with the lowest incomes. And I I don't quite understand that argument because it's actually like like they're saying that as if it's being used to defend why why we should do nothing. And so to me that sort of doesn't make a whole lot of sense, but but this is actually precisely why we are looking at providing incentives that promote deeper affordability. You know, things like increasing the building heights and the lot coverage, decreasing parking requirements, decreasing or you know providing financial incentives tax exemptions sdc reductions and all of those other ways and so that's actually where those are coming from those are designed very specifically to to address the affordability issue and so you know i, I think that the the argument of you know we shouldn't be doing this work because it's not gonna it's not gonna do enough it does to me that's that's like you know this is why we're absolutely why we're looking at all of those things so uh councilor clark thank you mayor and thank you commissioner edwards i appreciate your comments i agree entirely with the goal of what you're saying please don't misunderstand i would never suggest you shouldn't be doing this work I, obviously you have to my question is the how and are we going to do it sufficiently so that it's successful? That's all. The end result is that we want to have code that while it takes into account that the public respondents in the in the process that you went through said, go farther, right? My questions are, are we analyzing the consequences of going farther? 
are we looking at that's effect on affordability? Are we looking about the at the effect on creating a higher percentage of rentals versus a higher percentage of those that would that the market would prefer to own rather than rent? If you know, I mean, it, going to extremes, you could say, well, let's build you know nothing but uh, you know fifty foot towers full of apartments in in R1 neighborhoods and that'll that'll get us to the you know let's go farther now that's a ridiculous example but all of those would be rented and none of them would be owned i think the analysis of what percentage of new rentals are we creating versus what percentage of new um, units that could be owned is an important one i appreciate um uh where is he on my Zoom screen here? <laughs> Commissioner Ramey's point uh, about the 900 to 1,000 square foot places. I think that's wise too, because more adults are living singly than together today than have in history, and they thus need smaller space. However, we're also constructing the community of tomorrow in that, and I think that's an important consideration as well. So thank you. So let me, I'd, I'd like to make a brief comment. Um, first off, thank you very much for uh, spending this time with us. Um, I, I would look forward maybe to doing it ag again. I think there's a lot to talk about here. Um, I think the, the one comment I wanna make, or really, and we've said it, I think in a, a couple of times, but I wanna underline it. We're really uh, kind of going into a final stretch of public involvement on this. We've done a lot of work developing a draft set of code amendments. They're out there in the community for review. We've got uh, the public hearing now is uh, scheduled, I believe, for November 16th. And I think there's, there's ample time. There is time for people to uh, review it. There's a lot of material on the website. There's all of the background there that we went through over the last 10 months. If you, you want to go through or look at some of that. And uh, I would just really encourage people who are interested to send us some comments, uh, come and testify at the public hearing. We're gonna go through a series of deliberations after that, and we're gonna make a recommendation onto the council for your consideration and your deliberation. You'll have an additional public hearing. So uh, there's just uh, a lot of opportunity for people in the community to, uh, uh, get involved in this, and uh, we'd be very happy, very interested in all of the uh, the opinions and the comments. Thanks. Thank you all very much for your comments, your responses. I do think this is uh, very valuable for all of us to have these two bodies together uh, back and forth in this discussion, and I was happy to hear the responses, counselor questions. Um, I'm happy that we had a chance to hear directly from commissioners about your perspective on this. I think it does help us tremendously going forward. And I really appreciate the work. We are trying to create some stepping stones for people to get into housing that they can afford and purchase housing that they can afford. And this is a pretty um, enormous and very significant effort. So appreciate all of your work, appreciate all of the questions. Thank you all very much. And if there is no other additional comment or question, I we are adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>